وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعَجَبُ قَوْلُهُمْ أَيْذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَيْنَا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ الْأَغْلَالُ فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another episode of the Hot Seat Podcast. Once again, I'm joined by Sheikh Mohammed Tim Hambo and Sheikh Abdul Rahman Hassan. Joining me today to answer your questions that you guys sent in on is jinn possession real? Just as a reminder, if you have any questions on any of our episodes, you can ask them by emailing us at questions at the hot seat podcast.com. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, so I have six questions in total for you today. I'm going to get straight into it, inshallah. The first one is, we hear you guys saying a lot of the time, we have to follow the Salaf, their understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Is there an example of the Sahaba performing jinn exorcisms? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa tabi'ina lahum bi ihsanin ila yawmi ad-deen, amma ba'd. First of all, it's important that we understand what is meant by Salaf. The word salaf is those who preceded you. And we mean by those who preceded us in good, salaf al-salih. And the salaf is the three noble generation that the Prophet referred to in the hadith, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ The hadith of Imran ibn Hussain, that the best of generation is mine, and those who come after, and those who come after. So three generations. So the first generation is the Prophet and the companions, and then it's the students of the companions, which is the tabi'een. And then the third is the atba'u tabi'een. Those are what we refer to as the three golden generation. Um, so when this question is asking, did the Salaf practice this? We, we would involve the Prophet ﷺ because the Prophet said in the hadith, خير الناس قرني, my generation. So the ahadiths that refer to the jinn possession First of all, we start from the Prophet Sallallahu And if we find the Prophet Sallallahu Doing it on his companions Then it's found I, w- I, I, I don't understand why somebody would then say Well, did the companions do it amongst themselves? Or uh, did the Tabi'een do it? Or did the Khulafa uh, Rashidin do it? Or did the A'immatul Arba'a do it? I mean, you've got the Prophet Alayhi uh, Salatu Salam What else are you, are you looking for? Mm. Uh, I think I completely agree. I would just add to that that we can just give, let's just give, uh, we, we mentioned a lot of examples in the episode, to be honest. And I would definitely say to the person who asked the question to refer back to the episode and to go through each example so that they can get a more comprehensive uh, sort of outlook on the topic. But if we just talk about the Prophet's size and we talked about the hadith um, of Uthman ibn Al-As. Was that the hadith? Did I get yeah. the hadith right? Sorry, Uthman ibn Al-As. We talked about the hadith of Uthman ibn As when he said that something appeared uh, to him in his prayers. salawati. Something appeared to me in my prayers. And the Prophet wasallam saying it out, or enemy of Allah. So we spoke about this as an example of exorcism performed by the Prophet wasallam, And we give other examples from the Prophet wasallam in the episode. As for the Sahaba, we spoke about Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. Uh, عن, and others from the Sahaba and particularly I'm referring to the example of the person who was afflicted by insanity and when the companion read upon them they came up or they came out as though they had been released from chains that's an, an example because if somebody ha- is afflicted by insanity and immediately afterwards they, they come up as though nothing is wrong with them that would be a pretty good example to put forward for this kind of, you know, rukyo, or even the word exorcism is a difficult one to, you know, to define exactly how it's meant. Uh, and then afterwards, we talked about, you know, beyond that, beyond the three generations, we talked about Imam Ahmed and others. So I think that the episode contained a lot of examples throughout Islamic history, starting from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and moving onwards. And it's something again when we talked about ijma, that really has a, a very strong connotation with it that 
if we're talking about consensus on a particular matter and we talked about consensus from two points of view mm. so about consensus of the jinn entering the body and we talked about the consensus of which ruqya can be used to remove it so that was narrated by mm. al-imam al-nawawi al-hafidh ibn hajar mm -hmm. uh, and others who narrated that so if we bring all that together i think that shows that this was something that was commonly known and understood by the salaf and those who followed them in good and there's something else i wanted to add on there as well which is uh, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah in his kitab Zad, in his Zad al-Ma'ad, he stated that this concept of jinn possession, he said that it really, he said the overwhelming majority of people in which it happens to, he said it's people who have a deficiency in their religion. And we know that the Sahabas, when it came to their deen and their practicing of their religion is, is of a high level. So of course the jinn, jinn possession at the time of the Sahabas will be lower in number and uh, less uh, ruqya would be needed from the companions because of the khayriya and the good that they had and it would increase more in after them nah. but still despite that we see them we using still the see ruqya that, not only for the exorcism but i mean mm. in terms of using ruqya for sahih. a broad range of conditions because sahih. as sheikh said you actually if you look at the hadith we gather together the hadith of ruqya among the companions uh, the vast majority of it is for things that we would consider today to be medical mm. issues Things you would go to a hospital for mm. like a fever mm. or a scorpion mm. sting or a snake bite mm -hmm. uh, So the reason for that is exactly what Sheikh said mm. regarding the fact that as corruption and so on so increases the, No doubt the effects of the jinn uh -huh. And what we mentioned with regard to the statement of Ikrimah rahimahullah ta'ala With regard to how the jinn when people sought help from them and when people sought refuge with them, they increase in their facade and their corruption and they affect the, they cause that effect to the people. So this being said, you can see that probably in terms of the exorcism and in terms of jinn possession being less in the time of the early generations where there was a time of good and a time where the people were upon righteousness. Uh, but at the same time, we still see them using Rukia and teaching Rukia for a wide range of of issues as well so we can add that to also the answer inshallah and even if you look at the source i mean if you look at the textual evidences that have come regarding doing ruqya uh, why was the prophet teaching the companions to do ruqya on themselves if this is something that they that they didn't practice or they're not going to practice by teaching them what to say this is what you need to say um, the prophet is saying in the famous hadith that we we took in the episode where the prophet said hadith ibn abbas if he's a muslim uh, uh, when it's the 70,000 The scholars they took from that They don't ask ruqya from anyone That means they do ruqya on themselves So that means The Sahabas They wanted to be from this So all these instructions of the concept of ruqya And doing ruqya on yourself And also the Prophet doing ruqya on his Grandchildren meaning reading Quran And adkar and dua on them I mean, I, all this also applies in the companions. No. Okay. The second question I have for you is, what is the process for determining whether somebody is suffering from a psychological disorder or experiencing jinn possession? No. Okay. So I think here, uh, and the advice that I, I always give to people in this regard, is that people in the beginning don't need to be overly concerned about the distinction here. And the evidence for that is the general benefit of ruqya across a wide range of sicknesses and illnesses so ruqya was used as we said for things that we today would go to a hospital for it was used for uh, things that would be considered psychological illnesses in some of the hadith regarding the companions it talks about a man who was who was insane he was suffering from insanity you also have examples of ruqya as we said exorcism with regard to the jinn we talked about the hadith of Haman ibn As and others um, we also have the hadith of the child who the Prophet ﷺ uh, performed an exorcism for, who that child had not been right since the day that they were born. All of these were mentioned in the episode in detail with the references and so on. But I think if we, if we see the wide application of Ruqya, what we see is that in the beginning, this idea that you need to distinguish between whether it's a jinn issue or whether it's psychological, I would ask, what are you going to do differently? If you know that it's it's a psychological sickness or if you know that it's jinn possession, in the first instance, your actions are going to be very similar in terms of your recitation and so on. Later on, 
as it becomes clear to you exactly what is affecting the person, you can tailor your actions. You can seek specific t- kinds of cure and specific kinds of ruqya. But I think in the beginning, it's very, very beneficial and very important that you don't try to be overly, to overly distinguish. And some of the reasons I found for this is number one, it allows a person to go down the wrong path because they have a presumption. And they start with a van, a presumption. And then that presumption leads them to not seek the correct cure for the sickness that they have because they've presumed that it's a jinn problem and it could be, for example, the evil eye. It could be a, sick, a psychological problem. And because of that presumption and that they've stuck to it and they won't let it go, they've just kept on with that presumption and it sometimes delays the treatment. So what I would suggest is the best thing to begin with is to keep the, the ruqya general. And from the evidence of keeping the ruqya general are some of the adhkar which mention many different things in one in one in one statement. Uh, so they mention the evil eye. They mention uh, they mention magic. They mention all different kinds um, from the evil of everything that afflicts you. Kulli shay in Anything that harms you. Anything that is causing you affliction. So these adkar being general like that, I feel that. That gives us an evidence that we don't need in the beginning to be that specific about that before I start, I need to know exactly what it is that is wrong with this person. But it's a process that you will discover over time. So as you recite on the person with an intention for Allah to cure them from whatever, anything that is afflicting you, then over time, it will become clear what the problem is and you can start to tailor and make your ruqya very specific or you can start to bring in medical uh, treatments and so on as you as time goes on. And it also, the last point I would say on this is it also stops you from being manipulated by the jinn and the shayateen. Because again, the reverse applies of people who presume this person has a psychological problem and they go on that route with all kinds of drugs and all kinds of medical treatments and sometimes even the person is sectioned or restrained and it's, they suffer a lot. When in reality, all they need is, is a regular rookie program. So what I feel is, don't let the person get overly confused by these things in the beginning. Let them keep it general. Let them ask Allah for a cure from whatever it is. And let them ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show them what is wrong with the person. And then over time they can start to be more specific as they start to see more evidences that build up and qara'in uh, that show them what is really wrong with the person. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Okay, Shaykh Rahman, this one's for you. If the jinn can possess and marry human beings, like you mentioned on the episode, is it possible for a human to conceive a child with a jinn? So the concept of uh, humans and uh, the jinns getting married, the scholars, they, they use ayat from the Quran. For example, قوله تعالى لم لم يطمثهن إنس قبلهم ولا جان So the word لم يطمثهن, they said it means جمع that can take place between the jinn and the uh, ins. Uh, the ayah that the Sheikh mentioned in the uh, podcast, which is وَيَوْمَ يَحْشُرُهُمْ جَمِيعًا يَا مَعْشَرَ الْجِنِّ قَدْ اسْتَكْثَرْتُمْ مِنَ الْإِنْسِ وَقَالَ أُولِيَهُمْ مِنَ الْإِنْسِ رَبَّنَ اسْتَمْتَعْ بَعْضُنَا بِبَعْضٍ وَبَلَغْنَا أَجَلَنَا الَّذِي أَجَّلْتَنَا أَجَّلْتَ لَنَا قَالَ النَّارُ مَثْوَاكُمْ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ اللَّهِ إِن so this ayah, they say that the, the istimta here is referring to, and it means that which happens between the wife and the uh, and the husband. And even, this is a long time ago when I looked at it, and I didn't have the reference to look into it more, but Ibn Kathir in his Tahdib al-Athar, I think it was, he brought a statement of um, Ikrimah and some of the other Mufassirin under the ayah وَاسْتَفْزِزْ مَنِ اسْتَطَعْتَ مِنْهُمْ بِصَوْتِكَ وَأَجْلِبْ عَلَيْهِمْ بِخَيْلِكَ وَرَجْلِكَ وَشَارِكُمْ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ وَشَارِكُمْ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ That this can mean that the jinn can have children with um, and he brought a hadith where he said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said إِذَا جَامَعَ الرَّجُلُ إِمْرَأَتَهُ وَلَمْ يُسَمِّي إِن uh, something like that If a man Does intimacy with his wife And he doesn't say the best man uh, The shaytan will have intimacy With your wife with you 
And so these athar, they, they indicate and they show that the jima' can happen. Well, like Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Hajar al-Haytami, Qurtubi, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari and others, they mention that this is their view, that's what they hold. And some even said, like Ibn Jarir, this is the Qawl al-Jumhur, the view of the overwhelming majority. Like in, again, it needs more of a research to look in if it's the Qawl al-Rajah and each evidence needs to be. But these are the ayats that the scholars have brought forward. To say that this can happen. Well, ilmu عند الله. Knowledge is with Allah. Sheikh, do anything yeah. Okay, next question for you guys. What is the ruling on sharing jinn possession stories? Hmm. Well, like the when it comes to fitna, trials and tribulations, is that the person runs away from fitna. They don't present themselves to fitna. Because when Allah spoke about the jinn, He said, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, لا يفتننكم الشيطان يا بني آدم لا يفتننكم الشيطان كما أخرج أبويكم من الجنة don't let shaitan bring fitna to you. Mm-hmm. And we are taught to run away from fitna whenever we hear about it, whenever it's occurrence, or when it occurs, to avoid it. So, especially people who are weak, seeing these things, it sometimes brings into their hearts fear that's beyond and above required. Mm-hmm. And Allah says in the Quran, don't be scared of them, be scared, be scared of me. So, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, I think, was asked something like that. And his fatawa that he gave on Liqa Bab al Muftuha, he warned against it. He said these things should be avoided. But rather, what he was asked more was like stories that are written, like, you know, scary stories that people make. Mm-hmm. Whether the people can, can you make money out of that? Are you allowed to? And he, he gave tafsil. But he mentioned in there, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, this concept of, you know, spreading the stories of jinns and talking about it and mm. when there isn't a actual benefit behind it. And if it's yeah. the, intent, the intent behind it, if it's n- knowledge and something needs to be taken out of it and you want to bring something to people's minds, like in Minbabi al ihdath just to tell the story or, or even to scare people with For it. For entertainment or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a, a couple of extra points I would mention. I think definitely to add to what the Sheikh said, uh, the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ وَيُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَ فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ This is only the shaitan that makes you scared of his allies. Don't be scared of them, but be scared of me if you're really believers. There's another evidence of, with, with regard the shaitan loves you to, to have fear of the shaitan and to spread around fear of the shayateen. Um, and that fear, when it reaches a certain level, can even reach the level of shirk billahi azza wa jalla. Somebody can fear the shayateen, a, f- a fear that is only deserving to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it can reach a level that is a wasila to that, that is, or leads a person to uh, abandon some of the, the obligations in their religion. And ultimately, the other thing is this, this issue of concealing and covering what happens to your fellow brothers and sisters in Islam. You know, ultimately, as someone performing ruqya, you have an amana to keep concealed the things which are private. And those people who practice Rukia, you see a lot of private things come from the person. Maybe they become some of their aura becomes uncovered or they say things that they wouldn't want other people to know about. And then for a person to take that amana like that and then to you know to spread it around, even with the patient's permission sometimes or without. But I, I feel it's a bad habit to set for people that you are exposing people's private issues that should be between you and that should be br- any between for them alone and the fact that you had some knowledge of that because of a necessity or because of a need that that person had but then for you to spread that I, I would ask the question why and what is intended by it and I think that if it's entertainment that's perhaps one of the worst examples if someone says we spread it because we feel it will help the people to raise them in Iman then I don't feel this is the way that the Salaf used to go about raising people's Iman and helping people to become closer to Allah Azza wa even in writing, you know, writing stories about the jinn. Mm. Rather, th- what we have in the Quran and the Sunnah and what we have in terms of teaching us to get near to Allah and the things which raise our iman, this is what is required. And, and as for jinn stories to raise a person's iman, I don't think that's necessary. I think that if it needs to be done, a person can recount some of their experiences. Uh, I read uh, from an article by Sheikh Bin Baz, rahimullah ta'ala, that he recounted some of his experiences that he had had involving the jinn. Uh, but there was a, a clear educational purpose behind that. It wasn't entertainment, and it wasn't just putting out stuff that are going to get you views on, you know, or get you get people to listen to you. But it's about something that has a specific purpose. And generally, when I tell talk about experiences that I've had, 
involving the jinn, I try to anonymize it. You know, I don't give the person's personal information or information that I say I did a case and in this case I observed this happening and this is what Allah made easy for me to do and I found this to be beneficial. And then, so it has a reason for it. But as for just, I've never, I can honestly say I've never, I've never, to the best of my knowledge, videoed or, or had video recordings of me doing Rukia for people or anything that happened relating to the patient because I think that 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 patient confidentiality is one of the most important amanat that the Raqi has. And if he isn't concealing the person's private affairs and he isn't fulfilling that amana, then I would say that he's lacking the sifat, the characteristics that are befitting for a person to perform Rukia with. So a very similar question And you might have answered it already In that answer What is the ruling on watching Jinn exorcism on YouTube? Mm -hmm. I wanted to add a point on this I feel it's important Which relates to a lot of things Connected to the Jinn And that is the statement of Allah Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu In ja'akum fasiqun binaba in fatabayyanu An tusibu qawman bi jahalatin Fatusbihu ala ma fa'altum nadimeen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Surah Al-Hujurat or you who believe if there comes to you a disobedient person with some news, verify it. In, lest you harm a people out of ignorance and then become regretful over what you've done. Here, I want to focus on how the scholars, they mention that this doesn't just apply to the fasiq, but it, it applies to the one who is anonymous. Because the one who is anonymous, we don't know whether that person is a fasiq or someone who is righteous or not. And there is no one more anonymous to us than the jinn. Because we can't see them, we can't verify When they tell us where they're from, when they tell us who they are We have no way of verifying Even with a human being you have Some steps you can take To verify the truth Or the falsehood of what a person is saying But with regard to the jinn You have no way to verify that And the ayah tells us that there can be real harms That can come about When you take information That you're not sure of the truthfulness of it And you spread it among people you can cause harm to people and you can cause people to end up with false beliefs and ideas. And how many times I've personally seen that the jinn tell stories that, subhanAllah, these stories, at the minimum, they distract a person from remembering Allah. And in a worst case scenario, they can take a person far away from Islam because they tell, start to tell stories and people start to believe them and they tell things about what will happen in the future that they have their za'am about what will happen Their imagination about what will happen in the future Otherwise they don't know But what they imagine will happen Or they tell things for example Like they say this was done by your mother Or your, your sister or your brother or your uncle And you have no way of verifying that And indeed what it causes is families to break up And it causes news to be spread that's not And people they spread uh, conspiracy stories about things that happen And blame people without evidence I feel that there's a, so much harm can come from this so again, I'm not going to put all those YouTube videos in one category, but I would advise people to be very careful about what they believe from any source that can't be verified. And the jinn is definitely a source which is, it can't be, it can't be we can't verify the truth of what is said to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, final question I have for you guys. What is the evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah for the different forms and names of the jinn? So we mentioned a quote from, Ibn Abdul Bar, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, which mentions some of the names, and I mentioned a couple of extra ones which we had brought. Uh, these, each of them have examples. So, uh, first of all, the first one that we said is the general one that we used the word, which was jinn. And I think we've mentioned many examples uh, yeah. from that in Surah Al Jinn, elsewhere in the Quran, of the use of the word uh, jinn. Um, we also uh, mentioned the word shaitan, which again we have plenty of examples for. We mentioned the word marid, which again we have in Surah As-Safat. وَحِفْظًا مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْطَانٍ مَارِدْ And we mentioned the ifrit, which again we have, uh, which is again uh, mentioned in the Qur'an. Surah Al-Naml. In Surah Al-Naml. قَالَ عِفْرِيتُ مِنَ الْجَنِّ أَنَا أَعْتِيكَ بِي قَبْلَ أَنْ يَرْتَدَّ إِلَيْكَ طَرْفُكَ so we have now the ifrit. So we have now an example for, for the word uh, <coughs> ifrit. Uh, on top of that, we had the word uh, al ghul. And that is mentioned in some of the ahadith. Mm -hmm. It's mentioned in some of the ahadith that the Prophet said, Wala safa, wala ghul. It's mentioned in some of the ahadith like that. And we mentioned in some of them the word as saali. 
And this is a word that is mentioned linguistically, but I didn't find it narrated from the Prophet ﷺ, but I found it in some of the marasil from the tabi'een mm. that they used to use this word. Uh, can you think of any other shaykh that we didn't mention from the mm. names that we use for the jinn? Amir, that was the other one. Amir, and Arwah, that was two more that we mentioned. Um, I can't think of a hadith particularly. Can you think of one shaykh which has the... The Arabs used to use it. Uh, but I, I've seen Ibn Al-Qayyim using it in his Zat. But I don't know if the Prophet used it. Mm. Mm-hmm. So uh, these are like, maybe there are one or two that we might not find examples from the Prophet. But all of these words, you can find examples from the time in which Arabic language was taken. The, the time in which Arabic language was was in its pure form. So linguistically, we don't have a problem with the origin of all of them. But there are probably maybe two to three that we we might not find mentioned in the Hadith specifically, but we find them being used among the um, among the Arabs. I want to mention something back in one of the questions sure. that were asked. Um, that you know, one of the questioner he said that you know I never came across any of the companions doing this. And so, uh, when it comes to the adab al mufti wal mustafti, the scholars they talk about the manners of the one who's giving the fatwa, and the manners of the one who's asking the fatwa. They say that from the manners is that the student or the person who's asking the question, first of all, he doesn't assert something and then ask ask the question, because it goes against the concept of wanting to know. No. They said that Yunus ibn Abdul A'la came to Imam Shafi'i in Egypt at a very early stage when Imam Shafi'i moved from Iraq, because Imam Shafi'i had students in Iraq that he taught Abu Thawr, Hassan ibn Muhammad al-Zafarani, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and Others like that. Then he moved to Egypt and then he met Rabbi ibn Sulaiman al Muradi, Ismail ibn Yahya al Muzani, Abu Yaqub al Buwaiti, and Yunus ibn Abdul A'la. Yunus ibn Abdul A'la and a group of students they came to Imam Shafi'i, they wanted to test him. They wanted to see who is he? Who is this man? Shafi'i, we hear about him. And Yunus ibn Abdul A'la and others they were of the madhab of Imam Malik. So now this man's coming to the city, they want to put him to a test. They want to so he's claiming knowledge or, or knowledge is being claimed for him. So when they came and they asked an Imam Shafi'i, he refused to answer their question. Years went by, they became students, they started to participate in his lesson, they started to study, they started to learn. He saw from them that they were genuinely wanting to learn and so he called them. From them was Yunus ibn Abdul A'la and Nagru. So he said, what was your question that you asked me that day? They told him. He answered each and every one of those questions and he added additional knowledge on it for them that they didn't know themselves. And so then they said, why didn't you answer it like that when we first asked you? And he said, you guys came to me asking this question, not wanting to know. But You came and you asked me this question. So I want brothers and sisters who ask questions to understand that, that when you ask, you really are asking to know. You're not asking to... Uh, Assert something or push something. Second thing is, don't, as a student, as a person who's learning the religion, one thing we all have to come with is that we don't do this general negation that we say there isn't. But it was narrated that Imam Zuhri, Muhammad ibn Shahab Zuhri, was from the Tabi'in, was once uh, speaking about a narration and he said, وَلَمْ يَثْبُتْ ذَلِكَ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ this, this has not been affirmed from the Prophet ﷺ. So a man put his finger up and he said to him, Shaykh, did you read all of the hadiths of the Prophet? So he said, no. And we know that no one on, the, on this earth has come across all of the hadiths of the Prophet. Al-Imam Shafi'i, Kitab al Ilm, he said that anyone who claims that he's read all of the hadiths of the Prophet or has even memorized the hadith, all the hadiths of the Prophet is a liar. You can say the Quran, but not the hadiths. So Zuhri said, no, I haven't. He said, even half? He said, no. He said, one third? He said, no. He said, how can you then they say that this is not affirmed from the Prophet ﷺ? So, what we say is that the actions of the companions is in books that are volumes like Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba and Musannaf ibn Abdul Razak. And it's big books that are, tra- that are transmitted. So to say, I have not seen the com- or the companions did not do this haven't studied each and every companion and their situation. Well, I just wanted to mention that as well. 
جزاكم الله خير سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك